talked about affinity. Affinity. Affinity of an antibody or of a receptor to a ligand. Um, and so I just wanted to cover what kind of that, how do we measure uh, affinity of, of uh, ligand receptor interaction? And it's much like you would measure. Um, so basically, we've got this dissociation constant, um, which is saying that if, um, if we have a receptor and a ligand, and we have, and so they're separate. So we have free, free, we have receptor that is not bound and ligand that is not bound, or versus bound. This constant, so which is measured in uh, moles, so how many moles per liter of this ligand we have floating around. So when, so this number is going to be equal to whenever you have just as many, just as much ligand. So let's say we have our receptor, and it's bound to ligand, and we have our free-floating ligand out here, and we have a receptor over here. So whenever half of our ligand is not bound to receptor, and half is bound to receptor, that would be our dissociation. Um, that would be our, and so the the smaller the number, the smaller the number, the, the, the lower the moles we have to, to reach that point, that equilibrium point, would be your KD. So the lower that number, the higher the affinity. That means that, so, and you can have T cells can have like up to 10 to the fifth. Um, so this could, negative fifth, sorry. Um, so this KD could be one times 10 to the negative fifth for T cells. And it could be even greater for B cells, B cells. So, so we have, in both the case of B cells and T cells, you have this huge variety of receptors. And they start out kind of with the same, kind of roughly the same uh, variety. But then B cells, we talked about how B cells go into those germinal centers and when they become activated. And something they do in those germinal centers that I, I didn't talk about was they undergo what's called somatic hypermutation, which means that they further jumble up their DNA and really mix things up and change the receptor. So they had a receptor that bound to something. They go into that germinal center and they say, let's mix it up and see if we can get even stronger binding to the same thing. And so you get some further kind of uh, jumbling of the, the antibody receptors the, on B cells. And if they continue to have strong binding to that antigen, then they will, those B cells will survive and, and make more B cells with the same receptor. If they don't, then they'll die off. So it's kind of like a, a, you're going through a process of positive selection again in that uh, germinal center. So B cells can actually have um, up to 1 times 10 to the negative 12. Um, so the, their affinity could be even, even greater. So that means that if we have 0. 0.000, you know, 12 zeros, um, moles of this ligand, as long as you have even that much, half of it will be bound to the, to the receptor. And so, you know, as we were talking, as I covered earlier, um, this ligand receptor interaction is not a covalent bond, so it's kind of this reversible reaction because it's this non-covalent bond. But it it, it can bind so tightly that um, even if you just have a couple of these molecules floating around, they're going to be bound to that ligand. So um, that's kind of how you how we calculate and and the process to calculate that will, um, I think that's covered in chapter 20 and, and we'll discuss you know how they how they know or how they can quantitate that actual binding um, or how, how much affinity something has. Now again like we, I explained when you have um, when you have um, a binding event when you have a cell 
So now we have a cell that has these receptors. We're not talking about one receptor and one ligand interaction here. We're talking about many. And, and so the avidity of something is based on kind of the combination of events. So if I have two receptors and down to two, then it's gonna, the, the binding is going to be stronger. And if I have a co-receptor bound that's also going to interact with this um, MHC molecule, let's say, that's going to also strengthen that interaction. And if I have, um, and if my receptor happens to be an antibody, like an IgM antibody, there's up to 10 binding sites for that antigen. So you're multiplying the potential binding. Now, it's not a 10 times more uh, stronger, so the avidity isn't 10 times stronger than necessarily the, the affinity because you still have um, limitations on uh, location. So just because I have two binding sites for an antigen, if I don't have, if my antigens can't fit right next to each other, they're not going to bind at, you know, one to one. So if I have, let's just say I have an antigen binding site here, and an antigen binding site here, and an antigen binding site here. If my antigen's really big, I'm not going to be able to get antigen binding here and here, but I might be able to get it here and here. So it's not usually, it's not, in, in rarely is it ever a one-to-one, -one, but increased, increasing the number of sites increases what's called your avidity. Um, so, and that's why, and so now I'll just point so we can see. Um, and that's why we have most antibodies are bivalent, and, and they have more than one. So they'll bind. They have um, a chain that'll bind an antigen or target um, on two separate chains, and so that increases the avidity of that molecule because it can it can bind to one, but it's got a free site that can bind to another one. It can be bound to two as long as they're um, close enough together. So um, you're now increasing, because this isn't a permanent uh, interaction, if I lose this molecule, I might be bound to that, or at least be very close to it so I can have binding. So that increases the, chance, the likelihood that um, if, my, if an antibody binds to a bacteria, that it's going to stay bound to that bacteria long enough for that bacteria to be seen by a phagocytic cell, or um, be, or um, be targeted by um, a B cell, and then be phagocytosed, and then broken down and presented to T cells. So it increases that that chance. So the avidity, the avidity is increased. So affinity, when we're talking about affinity, we're just talking about one ligand. How strong is it bind to one um, receptor? When we're talking about avidity. We can increase avidity. So avidity can change over time because, for example, with T cells, um, you know, we, we can upregulate um, how many receptors, or, or we can upregulate um, these um, adhesion, other adhesion molecules. So they, we can start making more adhesion molecules that are going to adhere to other cells um, if that cell becomes active. So we're, we can actually increase the avidity. Um, if we see target initially. So we can increase that binding strength. Whereas like with a B cell, if a B cell undergoes hypermutation or somatic hypermutation in the, in the follicle and it ch actually changes the shape of its receptor, of its antibody, and it increases the, it, that would be an increase in affinity because that individual receptor would bind more strongly. To that ligand. So the Where, but then if I changed, class changed, so if I changed from one Ig molecule to a different Ig molecule and that different Ig molecule had more, um, more sites to bind antigen, then my avidity would go up. So, kind of. Does avidity act like a multiplier or is it more? It is a nonlinear multiplier. <laughs> so it increases the, the strength of this interaction. But it's not, a, again, it's, it's not, not linear. linear. So, 
Um, again, and that's another thing. Um, the naive cell that's going around looking around um, will have a certain. It, it'll have. It'll be making whatever it needs to make to to look. But then later on, if it sees something, it it may upregulate um, different. It may start making other um, receptors. In the case of IL-2, for example, naive cells, float, T cells floating around have a have a low have a, an IL-2 receptor that has um, two two IL-2 subunits that create this receptor, and that's the low affinity form. So it binds to IL-2, but not very strongly. So it takes a lot more IL-2 to bind to stay bound to that receptor and signal through it. Um, the thing to note is that. Those cells do have an IL-2 receptor, but it's the low affinity form. If that cell becomes activated, then it upregulates another subunit that strengthens that IL-2's affinity um, for IL-2. Now it becomes very sensitive, and it will it will soak up the IL-2 in the area. Um, something that I don't know that they cover in the book is um, T cells have this low affinity receptor on them, and if you um, flood Let's say we have T cells in a plate. If I flood that plate with IL-2, it will actually bind to that low affinity IL-2 because I've, I've increased the amount of IL-2 in the area. And it will, even though it's low affinity, it'll still bind and signal through that IL-2 receptor. And actually, when that IL-2 receptor becomes activated, it will signal to, to make the, the, other, um, the other subunit of IL-2 that will change it to a high affinity uh, form of IL-2. So, this is kind of a mechanism where T cells, if they're in a, an area of high inflammation or they're in an area where other T cells are becoming activated, the IL-2 concentration in the local area increases to where it can bind to even the low affinity and signal through the low affinity um, form of IL-2 receptor, and that will upregulate the other, um, the other chain of IL-2 and change it to a high affinity form of IL-2 receptor, then it will then um, basically signal through, and we'll talk about, it'll signal through that receptor, it'll upregulate transcription factors that will actually drive uh, proliferation of those T cells. And in research people have, and in the clinic, people have taken advantage of that. For example, they treat melanoma, the, one of the common treatments for melanoma is high-dose IL-2 treatment. Um, not the most pleasant treatment because you're basically getting the really high-grade flu-like symptoms that are even more extreme uh, because you're inducing just this global uh, activation state. But um, so if for, for cancer, we kind of use IL-2 and we'll, we'll treat people with high-dose IL-2. Um, and even for um, if you're doing research on T cells, if you want to keep T cells growing in culture, you, you add IL-2. Um, the other thing that is um, important to note is T cells um, and, and some APCs kind of can, they can create a local microenvironment. So not just are they secreting things like IL-2, but they can localize that, that secretion of IL-2 to one area. It's kind of similar to what would happen in a neuromuscular junction to where you have neuro, um, neurotransmitter is being released, but it's like being released in just that area where you would have the receptor for it. So it would take a lot less because you're creating a concentrated area here where, for example, let's say we have low affinity receptors, might bind to it because we secreted the, the cytokine right there in the local area. And how cells do that is they use the same machinery that they would use for cell division, and so mitotic spindles. So they, it's really cool, and, and there are certain videos out there. I, I didn't find one this morning. I find it, I found where you can see that. Let's see. You can kind of see, you can see that localization, but I've seen even better videos where you can actually see the mitotic spindles being directed toward where the two cells are. So you have an antigen-presenting cell and you have a T cell, and, and the receptors come and they meet, and they touch. And you'll see those cells change shape, 
and kind of narrow down towards each other, and those mitotic spindles will shoot out towards that synapse. And so that, um, let's So here you have an antigen presenting cell, and it's basically recognized that T cell, they bind, and you get this kind of, they, they, the, the membranes will kind of merge and come together. The red one. So, um, and, and this is actually um, not as good a, a picture as I've seen before. So I'll, I'll try and find something that is, is a good representation, because it is pretty cool. Um, so, what you get is these mitotic spindles. So you have all these vesicles in the cell. And these vesicles may be full of cytokines, so because they're being trafficked to the cell surface, maybe not directionally directed, but then you get these mitotic spindles that will shoot out and they'll kind of push everything towards where the two cells are meeting. Every, all the cytokine gets basic exocytos, and so you create this local area of activation. And so does it shoot out like a thin ray or like hammy, or is it a um, it, it, it is, it, so it's making that spindle, and as right. it puts that spindle together, you'll, you'll see it, it'll just extend out, and it will, um, so cells aren't just your amorphous bag of molecules. They have right. a lot of structure to them, but there's a lot of um, scaffolding built in there, so it pushes that whole set a scaffolding toward that area and it kind of ejects all the, all the um, basically all the um, granules that are, are within the, the um, cell. Mm -hmm. So the Golgi, the, um, all the, um, and, and we'll talk about it too, they, they also are going to be um, compartments that are filled with MHC molecules in, in the case of antigen presenting cells or T cell receptors. So they're going to they're going to localize T cell receptors, not only T cell receptors, but also eject cytokine if those happen to be in there. So, so what's the purpose that you have in my part of the spindle that shoot out at an ATC and a T cell? It's to create a local area of concentration for cytokine. So that will increase the chances that um, the ligand meets the receptor, binds the receptor, and it also helps to make sure. So let's say I have two cells. And this T cell recognizes this antigen presenting cell. And this T cell receptor is specific for, for that bacterial antigen. But right next to it is a T cell that recognizes a protein that looks an awful lot like a protein that you make in, um, in the pancreas. If, if I don't have a local activation type of thing that says this T cell is going to get activated by this APC, then the guy next door, who doesn't have specificity for any antigen, might get the wrong idea. He might get so that's why we kind of create these local areas of activation so that this these two guys are interacting, but they're not really influencing non-specific T cells in the surrounding area, and so you're able to get a lot more specificity um, there. Um, we, we get into trouble, and that's where some trouble may may occur is you get um, what's called epitope spreading. Um, when you have a really strong reaction to something, you could um, induce another reaction because we're creating an environment that is a little bit more inflammatory, a little bit, bit more excitatory, and so there is potential that you could activate some other cells. Now, when we teach this, we try and do it in black and white, where these are, these are the cells that are interacting with nobody else. But in, in, it, it's most things that you learn in biology are going to be on this spectrum. And having that idea that you, most genes aren't on and off. They're leaky or on really strong. So it's not usually black and white, but we have to teach things in kind of those black and white um, ways. Otherwise, um, I would just say, well, it's kind of like this. and. Let's hope for the best, and you know, so we kind of have to um, generalize a little bit. All right, so um, cells meet, 
the ligands bind to receptors. Now what's going to happen? So now there's, there's signaling inside. And um, you get a signal cascade. And this really complex cascade, more than one cascade is going to occur usually when a T cell binds to an antigen presenting cell. Um, leads to uh, motility. So maybe you want cells, B cells become activated, they're going to move to T cell rich areas. They're going to endocytose whatever they're bound to, chop it up. So they're doing things. When they see signal, that's the, that's, they, they need to now change, change gears, switch gears. They need to start making, you know, they need to turn on transcriptional machinery to, um, to make things that are going to make them motile, that are going to make the proteins that tell them to endocytose things. They're going to um, need to stop bringing in things, and looking for antigens, putting out those, like in the case of dendritic cells, they, they stop being so dendritic and searching for things and they, they kind of become static in that they're presenting what they present. So they, they switch gears. So a lot of this is happening once you signal through those receptors. Um, they're going to start proliferating or they're going to die if they don't get the right set of signals. Um, and what we're going to see is the same pathways that are used for T cells are also used for B cells. Um, there are a few different um, individual players in that, or you know, the enzymes might vary a little bit, but then once you get further downstream, so that you're going to hear the term downstream and, and upstream. Upstream just means closer to the receptor, what's happening right there, kind of at the receptor. Downstream is the further we get towards transcription factors entering the nucleus. And so um, upstream, there might be a little bit of difference, but then usually downstream, they are um, identical. And so here's kind of a general pathway of a generic T cell and So here's your generic T cell. So this, you have your, your T cell receptor. Here's your MHC molecule bound to some type of peptide or, or maybe a, um, a lipid or sugar. And then you have your, here's your CD4 or your CD8 will come and increase the avidity of this interaction because it's also going to bind to a very invariant region and so we're also going to, I'm also going to use the term invariant. And when I'm talking about um, invariant, I mean something that's common between all of us. We all, to, all of us are going to have that same kind of um, invariant region. It, it's this region that's going to be variant, that's going to vary from T cell receptor to T cell receptor, but these um, stay the same so that we can increase that interaction um, with, with the, regardless of the MHC um, TCR combination. Um, and then you'll notice here too, B cell and T cell receptors are very short, like they come through the, the cell membrane and then they, they usually stop abruptly. And so by themselves, they actually won't signal. So if I don't have associated molecules that will bind to them, um, you won't get activation. And so um, there are studies where you cut off maybe um, sites or you mutate sites that will bind to these associated molecules. If you do that, you won't get T cell activation or you won't get B cell activation. So they require all these other molecules to come in close contact with them. And here we have this red region is representative of a lipid raft region. Again, that's a region of high cholesterol, um, of different um, type of um, phospholipids. So the, the actual um, the lipids in this area are going to be a little bit different. And they're actually going to, those lipids, there are some specialized lipids that are associated with these rafts that will be involved in this pathway that will actually have some type of signaling function. Um, you said what? R-A-F-T? R-A-F-T. R -A -F -T. Um, let's see. Receptor, let's see. Uh, is this wrapped up here? Uh, you won't see it, but I'll, I'll the next slide. Wrapped, like uh, you build a raft and float to safety. Uh, you know, wrapped. 
Um, so there's these little rafts floating around. And so T cell receptors usually start out just kind of not outside of those rafts. When they bind the ligand, they will localize to the raft, and there's raft-associated um, molecules that will um, be in those rafts. And then, and also, these T cell receptors will become closely associated with these other associated receptor-associated molecules. In the case of T cells, they're CE3 molecules, um, and so they come in contact. And then there are these sites that become phosphorylated, these ITAMs, and we'll, we'll cover that in a sec, what was an ITAM. So you have these specific sites that once they become phosphorylated, now they can bind to these adapter proteins, and then those proteins will have um, either phosphor, they, they will be kinases, they will phosphorylate or dephosphorylate other molecules, and by changing, just by taking off a, a phosphate group or adding one, you're gonna change the activity of um, that set of proteins, and that's going to maybe um, modify, in this case, the TLC um, mechanism is going to now take lipids, and it's going to kind of chew them up a little bit, and it's going to turn them, it's going to change this PIP2 to PIP3, it's going to leave behind this DAG, which is also this lipid, but it's going to have, that lipid's going to have activity over here in this pathway, so we're creating all of these downstream events that are going to be basically cause this cascade of things to happen that happen just because we first found that receptor. And then downstream, and so a sugar gets chewed off of one at the end of one of these uh, uh, glycoproteins, and then um, and that's that IP3. That IP3 will then bind to the um, endoplasmic particulum, and it will cause the release of calcium. Uh, if you've taken A and P, you'll know that there are other cells, lots of different cells in the body that use the same similar mechanisms of releasing um, calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. In the case of muscle cells, we call it the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but that's how our muscles are activated, is, is release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and those, that, those calcium molecules are going to do something. So, if you look in, in, in the cell, concentrations of so calcium are very low, except for in the ER or outside of the cell. So there's mechanisms to open up channels inside the cell of calcium. And that's another way to activate a, a T cell, is if you punch holes in the cell membrane and allow calcium to rush in, you can activate T cells. So you can very non-specifically, let's say I have a plate full of T cells and they all have different T cell receptors and I just want to I just want them all to proliferate. So I'll put in um, something that kind of allows calcium into those cells. They'll all, I, I skip all this upstream stuff and basically jump to this stage where calcium now will bind um, to a molecule. And that molecule, that calmodulin, calcineurin becomes, calcineurin becomes activated and then will um, release in fat from a molecule that's holding on to it and making it too big to, to go through the, the nuclear membrane. That NFAT transcription factor will go in and it'll start making making things that says, hey, proliferate. So um, knowing these pathways allows us to work with these cells, allows us to manipulate them in vivo and in vitro. Um, and so you have not only this pathway, but we have uh, other pathways that are also um, reg upregulating other transcription factors. And these aren't the only things. We also usually have, um, and we'll talk about them in the next chapter, cytokine receptors. And so let's say this all happens, I'm, I may need also signaling through a cytokine receptor that is also going to upregulate other genes to say, because sometimes what will happen is when cells start to proliferate out of control, if they don't receive certain signals, they'll apoptose, they'll die. So cell induced, cell, uh, uh, so you have proliferation induced cell death that might occur if, if this cell becomes active but then he doesn't receive any type of inflammatory signal or he doesn't receive IL-2, um, an IL-2 signal, that cell is going to die. So if I, if I don't have the right cytokines in my dish or in my local environment and I stimulate cells to proliferate, they might proliferate for one round and then die. So there, we have all these checks, checks and balances. 
um, in we place. Need to know all this PIP so these three pathways are going to be found in both T cells and B cells. It is good to kind of memorize this pathway. So that's what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to kind of draw these out in a way and I'm going to I'm going to have I'm going to make boxes. And I'm going to say I want you to be able to if I give you this picture and I, and I erase something that's in one of these boxes, you should be able to fill it in. So what are the numbers? Yes, this is a good one to know. But we need to understand what's PIP do, PRC do. It's always good to know. It, um, is this? Um, I can't promise I'll have questions about it, but it's always good to know who's a kinase. So is this is this a protein that is adding that phosphate? Is it taking a phosphate away? Um, is this thing a lipid? Um, what kind of lipid is it? That's, that's a good thing to know. Is it an enzyme? Um, is it a transcription factor? Um, and that just gives you a better, um, kind of broader knowledge of what, what's going on here, pathway-wise. Um, and, and so for, for T cells and B cells, these are the three important pathways to, to know. Which um, one is the PPC? So you have this whole pathway that is that starts yeah. with the binding. So this PLC basically from from the CD3 molecule. So in the case, and, and I'll, have, I'll pull up a picture of that in a sec. Um, from CD3 molecules. T cell receptor binding to antigen. Which one is CD3? So CD3 will be these guys here. So CD3, alpha, and beta. Actually, I don't know which one's which, but <laughs> one's alpha, one's beta. Um, and so you, you, you have this this met, this complex of CD3 molecules that associate with the, the tail of that T cell receptor. And they do that in lipid graphs and um, will become closer more closely associated in that So which one is the phosphor that you have a P in there? Yeah. Adapter phosphor. So those, those start out um, not phosphorylated and then they become phosphorylated when, when we signal, when we want signal. So this would be one pathway starting from that T cell receptor and working your way down through um, this PLC um, complex and working our way down through calcium release, catalogen, and MPAP. And then you would have this other one where you have actually left over from this interaction, you have PAG. PAG is going to then um, bind to this RAS GRP SOS um, complex, and that's going to now um, go through this path, MAP kinase pathway. So that MAP kinase pathway, or it's called MAP kinase kinase pathway. So there's these, the, these this cascade of kinases that are going to. Um, that are going to basically signal down to AP1, and then the other pathway is going to be this PKC pathway that's going to basically release NF kappa B, which is really important um, in, in cell proliferation, um, not only in T cells, but in B cells and in, in other cells as well. Um, if you knock out NF kappa B, that's very bad. Um, I don't think you can survive that. So, um, what's happening? What's happening at the T cell receptor itself is you're getting, um, or in this case, this might be a receptor for a cytokine. Um, common mechanism that happens is um, binding the the ligand itself will bring will bring these molecules together and cause them to dimerize. And that dimerization changes their conformation to the point where now they can either co-localize with, with things or change shape to allow um, kinases to add phosphates. And, and so basically you get this what multimerization can occur. You cluster the receptors and they're localized in the lipid, lipid graph. So you get this movement of the receptors and even um, grouping of receptors together in a local area, because when you come in contact with that uh, ABC, you're not there. You're not becoming this linear membrane. So the the two brown cells are going to come together, and I want all my receptors right here, and all my ligands right here. I don't want them all the way around the cell. So what you get is if somebody sees each other, they will bind antigen that will kind of cause them to localize and, and you'll concentrate a lot of receptors and then that mitotic spindle will actually bring in more receptors and you'll kind of have them kind of migrating to the synapse um, 
and, and moving together, moving into regions of the membrane that have other enzyme activity uh, molecules, and, and that whole pathway is going to start. Um, so antigen, antigen mediated receptor clustering. So here, here is an example of not just one molecule binding to antigen and then dimerizing and kind of pulling tight in, but you have more than one Ig molecule here is there are our antibody receptors on B cell, and because they have um, antigen binding sites here and here, and if they both bind to antigen, it brings them together by bringing those two um, receptors together. Now we are bringing them into lipographs, and we have this, these Lin molecules that are now going to help to, call, to basically be the first signal in the pathway to activation. So here they're, they're not in rafts. Here we have found them together, brought them into rafts, and localized them to an area where they're now going to cause signaling to occur. So just to make sure I have the right idea, memorization is when I put a heterosclerosis and they actually change their like the they will change the shape of dimerization. Usually, when we say dimerization, we're going to, we're talking about a um, a covalent bond that's going to be. So most of these receptors are um, heterodimeric or multivalent. I mean, multi. They have multiple um, chains. Okay. And so, in the case of like T cells, we have like an alpha and a beta, mm -hmm. and those. So you have two chains that make up the receptor itself, and those two chains aren't necessarily attached, but if they see antigen, then they'll, they'll um, actually dimerize. They will now become bound to each other. So it's now, if I run that on a Western um, and, and I look for bands, I'm going to see one large band because okay. they're covalently bound to each other. So it's just the, re the, the, the two chains of the receptors bind together, mm -hmm. so it can bind the antigen. Um, it, it, the, because they, it strengthens that, that bond, then it changes comp shape enough um, okay. to, to move it or to increase its um, uh, likelihood of moving to an area. So it just changes the shape to a point where maybe it can now localize to something where okay. it couldn't be before. Okay. Also moving, um, you know, it might change the shape to, to um, open up uh, a, a site for phosphorylation that wasn't accessible So you've got these Lin blink um, SYKs that are involved in signaling through B cells and similar molecules in T cells with different exact molecules. So like these lipographs, so if we're looking at the fluid mosaic of, of a lipid membrane, you get these areas that are stiffer um, because they have a lot of cholesterol in them. They have other um, lipids in them that actually may have uh, proteins associated with them that um, then when they come in contact with the T cell receptor might um, cause activation. So, um, co-receptors are really important. Um, also, as I explained, B and T cells have really short cytoplasmic portions that don't have really sick, that don't um, cause in themselves signaling, but B cells associate with these Ig um, alpha and beta molecules, and they have these. Um, so they have these sites that get phosphorylated on them. these ITAMs on both on these and I, what an ITAM is it's the immunoreceptor tyrosine activation motif so ITAM is a good thing to understand what it is but it's basically just a motif or a, a something that's on that receptor that tail of that receptor that um, can be phosphorylated is a target part phosphorylation and if it's not phosphorylated then it's not going to induce downstream events. If it does become phosphorylated, it will allow for those downstream events to occur. Um, so here we also have um, co-receptors, CD21 will bind to complement 
So complement, and we're going to talk about what complement is, but complement is the set of, set of proteins that will bind to the, the constant region of antibodies. So antibodies have the variable, or the, you know, where, where they have different specificities for antigen, but the tail is going to be the same in, in all of them, and that tail can bind to proteins that basically are big proteins that um, alert immune cells that something's out of place and they will bind to receptors on cells so that cells can kind of, uh, cells other than B cells can bind, like dendritic cells can bind to these um, MHC molecules that are floating around looking for things. Um, they can phagocytose those things and then, um, so basically, um, uh, they will, they'll bind to, to that. Um, but there's also CD4, like for example, CD4 or CD8 um, molecule will strengthen, increase the avidity. And um, so you, and you have these CD3 molecules, so you have all these different epsilon, delta, gamma, or delta, epsilon, um, sigma, um, different um, gamma, um, I guess this is sigma, whatever. Um, so you basically have this complex of CD3 molecules that's going to associate with that T cell receptor and have they have ITAMs on them. Um, you also have, uh, these are co-stimulatory molecules. So these are another set of molecules that are important and we're going to talk about them later. But um, CD28, so here you have your, your T cell receptor and here's your antigen presenting cell. And professional antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, um, B cells will have this either CD80 or CD86, also called B7.1, um, can bind to CD28 and then signal. And if they don't get this co-stimulatory signal, then those cells will not um, continue to proliferate and they actually may become <coughs> tolerogenic cells. So if we if they see cell, if they don't see antigen being presented by it, and professional antigen presenting cell, then they may not become activated. So if they don't see the antigen um, with the right type of co-stimulatory molecules, they may not uh, become effective cells. Yeah. This is CD80? CD80. Yes. Well, and 86. Those are two common co-stimulatory molecules that are present there on B cells and dendritic cells. And Really important, um, if we want to um, block, uh, let's say you have autoimmune disease, we can, we can block this interaction and really suppress the immune system if we block that interaction. Um, or if I want to stimulate cells um, in vitro, I need to have this signal. So I either need to have a cell that has this co uh, this uh, co-stimulatory molecule, or I need to have an antibody that will bind to this receptor, the CD28 receptor. So I have to have an anti-CD28 antibody in there to, to signal through that that pathway. So which cell has the CD8 and CD8? So the APC has CD8 and 86, and the T cell has CD28. APC has yeah. So T cell have. So yep, the 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 APC have the co-stimulatory molecule, and the T cell has the receptor for that co-stimulatory. When you say APC, usually you say antigen the, presenting. Yeah, cell. I know. Is it a red cell and the all B cells, B cells can be APCs. Dendritic cells can be APCs. Mm -hmm. um, other macrophages, some macrophages can become be APCs. So. Um, these are specialized immune cells that are going to um, be in areas and they're going to go to areas of inflammation. They're going to be the resident cells in lymph nodes, as we discussed. So dendritic cells are really important in lymph nodes. B cells are very important in lymph nodes. So they are professional. And that's, and, and, and the reason, or the, the idea is that um, these dendritic cells are going to be in um, the lymph nodes. And maybe if we see um, antigen outside of the lymph node, maybe it's not dangerous. Um, it might, you know, so we're trying to kind of limit where we're activating our T cells. All right, so, um, so tyrosine phosphorylation, that's really important. 
early step, so up, this upstream um, step in, in T cell or, or, or even B, in B cell. So in the CD3 and the Ig, so CD3 and T cells and the Ig alpha and beta and B cells are phosphorylated on those ITAMs, so those amino receptor tyrosine activation motifs. Um, so phosphorylated tyrosines in, in those molecules serve as docking points for adapter molecules. And those adapter molecules are these SARC family kinases. Um, they, or the SARC family kinases will, are the molecules that will, um, I'm sorry, that those are the molecules that will phosphorylate and um, they can become active when they become, so it's kind of this, once they become activated, um, they will then activate themselves and it's basically like a positive um, event that is going to now cascade. Um, if one becomes activated, it can activate another, it activates itself. And so basically you get this cascade that now will phosphorylate the ITAMs. Um, and then those phosphorylated ITAMs are now going to bind to other. Um, Which one are the ITAMs? This is the orange one? So ITAM. So these are the SARC, whoop, these are the SARC um, family kinases. So these are the kinases, and these kinases are going to be localized to those lipid wraps. And so that's how we can keep from activating uh, the receptor. If it's not in a wrap, then it's not going to come in contact with these kinase, kinases. When you say wrap, you say SH2? So the SH2, these, these kind different, so this is a, a region or a, um, okay. a of okay. the SARC family. No, that's not on the ICAM. I, I'm sorry. This, um, so the ITAM is on the CD3 or the IG, and then this uh, kinase is associated with the membrane, the early lipid wrap. And so when they come in close contact now, this kinase can now phosphorylate the ICAM. So the ITAM is not shown in this picture. These are the SARC family kinases. And then what they do is they're going to um, basically um, adapt the proteins, help gather members of the signaling pathway, phosphorylation of the serine threonine residues um, is this common step. So you don't need to memorize these pathways. It's just good to know that um, this is this, this simple addition of uh, phosphate group is going to change the shape of the conformation to the point where they can now bind to some other molecule. And so we can easily remove or add phosphate groups to easily turn something on or off. Um, so there's a lot of different SARC um, family kinases. And um, a lot of research is put into what are the different kinases, who, what cells express them. Uh, and the interest is that, um, let's say we have cancer cells that are making different kinases than our, our, than our um, immune cells. Um, we have small molecules that can inhibit different kinases, and so if we know what kinases are. And so every cell is going to have kind of different sets of kinases. They all do the same thing, but they, um, by knowing what kinases are involved in what cells, we can actually uh, have therapies that are really targeted therapies that are less, um, less broad than maybe a, a general chemotherapy. Um, so the other um, player, so we talked about kinases. So after the kinases, we get um, we have molecules that are going to associate with those CD3 or CD8 uh, IGs, and then we also have a, another important player are the the phosphorylation of membrane phospholipids, um, and the basically um, they rec recruit. Uh, these proteins that have these pH domains um, to the membrane. So basically, um, PIP2 is an important one. So phosphatidine and inositol um, may be phosphorylated. Um, so this phosphatidyl and inositol 3 kinase um, will now have um, become phosphorylated, have kinase activity. It will become, and PIP2 will become PIP3. Um, which can now bind to proteins with these uh, pH domains on them. So now we can have, uh, so proteins that are normally 
um, in the cytoplasm of the cell, not localized to the membrane. We can now localize those cells to the membrane. And again, localization of the mechanism right there at the membrane will now allow for them to interact with other molecules. So we're kind of creating this cascade where we're bringing in the molecule. We're either localizing the molecule we need, or we're changing its conformation so that it can signal to the next next player in the, the pathway. Yes. Which one PIP2 of the So here we have PIP3, because we've added a phosphate. So this is this is just a, so this is a cartoon of a lipid. Mm -hmm. We have our um, hydrophobic uh, or hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails, and then we have here's our, so here's our tail in more molecular um, form, and then we have these heads. This um, and that can be kind of phosphorylated. So it goes from PIP2 to PIP3. So PIP2 and PIP. Are just lipids. Yeah, uh, fossil lipids. So, yeah. And so those are going to be associated with your lipid graph as well. So, again, local, not throughout the whole um, cell membrane, but localized to those higher cholesterol rich areas. So, this is just creating the change for the signal we move through? Yep. Um, another um, player is going to be, um, so this PIP2 then is further broken down by phospholipase C or this PLC um, and that causes, um, and that then the inositol triphosphate or IP3. So it basically chews up, further chews off the sugar and now that, so then it leaves behind this diacylglycerol. So it just leaves behind this this lipid, and then it um, the sugar, so the triphosphate, so it chew, further chews off that sugar. That sugar now will go to the ER and release calcium. And so this is the next kind of step, uh, individual step. And I'm just going to try to run through these a little faster because we're almost out of time. I want to get through chapter three. Um, uh, which we may or may not do, but calcium is released by the ER. Now that you have calcium, which is normally calcium is really low in the cytoplasm, so now that we release calcium, it can bind to um, the calmodulin, um, and then that, that can now basically has two uh, binding domains for two sets of calcium ions. That kind of unwraps it, and now it can um, bind to this calmodulin binding site. Um, and then that will further go and um, interact with NFAT, dephosphorylate NFAT, and then that NFAT can go in, that transcription factor can go in and now starts to be a transcription factor and turn on a bunch of genes that are important for um, cell proliferation uh, and other functions. And some of these functions are going to be um, general functions that other cells need in fact, but based on um, the, the cell and uh, other factors, it may induce other, other genes as well. So there's lots of genes that are induced by the NFAT. And you don't need to memorize them. So um, the other pathway is going to be this RAS map kinase cascade. So um, RAS is a G protein. You've probably heard about G proteins, talked about them in the past, so I'm not going to cover them in any detail. It becomes active when it swaps a GTP molecule for its GDP molecule. Um, and once that RAS is activated, then it participates in this downstream signaling event. And here is our RAS. So DAG um, interacts. So that, that leftover lipid now is, is kind of this, this lipid now can associate and interact with RAS and this SOS and, and basically cause this downstream um, event where we get this map kinase 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 then now um, we'll be, have kinase activity on this map kinase kinase and then it'll have kinase activity on this map kinase and then that will then um, go and it will ELK1 to now um, allow for transcription. So 
it's it, this is another uh, M4 pathway. And again, I'll I'll make um, a nice diagram of each of the three pathways and kind of have boxes around what I think is important for you to know what we'll be able to, to fill in. So we just remember young Barbara. Yes. Okay. Don't forget about it. Yeah, I won't forget about it. I won't give you a quiz without letting you prepare for it. Um, so, but do keep an eye out for your Canvas announcements because I'll make a Canvas announcement when I put it up. So um, just keep an eye out for, check, check those announcements daily and I will promise to make an announcement as soon as it goes up. Um, so I'm going to move through to the next one. Then you guys have this PKC activates NF kappa B. Um, and again, it's going to be a similar type of pathway. Um, and it's going to be based on ubiquitination. So um, that's an important thing to know. You probably have talked about maybe ubiquitination before, but basically um, um, you don't need to memorize or, or understand the pathways so much as um, what I'll, I'll give you on the um, study guide. So um, we wanted to move on to structure of antibodies and T cells. We are going to cover both antibodies and T cells in more depth when we talk about how um, variable regions are, are basically made um, and what that process is, um, recombination. So the genetic recombination that creates a, uh, the variant region, but um, it's good to know when we're talking about antibodies, we have variable regions and then we have constant regions. So these constant regions are important because um, they're going to be recognized, they're what's going to be in the cell, and they're going to associate with the other Ig molecules and allow for signaling. If we have variants on those, they may not signal. So um, we have to have constant regions, and then we have variable regions um, that create the uh, antigen binding grooves that are variant. And so we have multiple chains of these. Um, so for B cells, um, we have these Ig, for example, IgM, and we have different variant regions, different um, chains, and you can see, well, you can't see, but there's, um, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> they are covalently bound to each other. You have these um, cysteine bonds, or uh, so uh, T cell receptors are, are also made out of two different, um, two different chains, so they're dimers. Um, and then here we have our class, so switching gears to the APC, these are all either B cells or T cells. Um, APCs also have class one and class two. Um, actually, I, I say APCs, all of our cells have class one, which is a dimer, so it has this beta two microglobulin, but it doesn't really um, shape the, the binding group. So all of that's in one chain, but it's important that this beta-2 microglobulin that is constant um, kind of supports that structure. Without that, it's not going to work. So it's still a dimer. Um, class 2, which is expressed only in professional antigen-presenting cells, um, has, is also a dimer, but both chains are make up that antigen binding group um, that, that binds kind of non-specifically to a wide array of different like, peptides or, or molecules. So, um, and then we have our molecules that are associated with it. There are also these class of, of molecules called Ig immunoglobulin. They, they have these immunoglobulin domains. We have CD2, CD3, CD4. These are all associated with T cells. These are the T cell accessory proteins that are really important in signaling. And then for B cells, we have um, these other um, IGs. Um, we have BCAM, ICAM. LFA, and you don't need to memorize those necessarily, but it's good to know. Um, those are all similar classes of molecules. Here we have kind of a, a zoomed in on an antibody. Um, you have these anti antibody um, binding regions, or antigen binding regions, sorry, um, that are on both different chains. You have this hinge region which is, allows um, for movement for to maybe bind to. And that hinge region is important because um, if I have a really big cell and a little piece of antigen sticking off of it, that this cell can recognize if it was very rigid, 
so it would be hard to kind of find and, and bind to different shapes. So that kind of gives it a little more flexibility because it has a hinge region. And then we have this constant region, which is going to then um, be basically go through, the, it will um, have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic region to it that allows it to basically stay in that, that membrane until it is cleaved and released and becomes a soluble free floating antigen or uh, antibody. So there's different classes of antibodies, such as IgMs and IgGs, IgG being the most common, um, IgEs and some of these are associated with allergies, um, some of them are are associated with different events. We have IgM, which forms the pentamer, IgA. So um, different classes and of, of antibodies. Um, so read through the book. Um, here's a good kind of summary of what the different classes are, what type of, so they have different kinds of heading chains. Um, how many uh, constant Ig domains do each of them have? Um, you don't need to memorize this. Uh, and well, then we're going to call know it. From this one. Um, okay. I don't think I'm going to ask it okay. to fill this out. Um, so we'll talk about um, what makes up the, the variable regions and, and, and cover that in more detail, which is why I'm not going to focus as much on this chapter. I just want you to know kind of more, um, have in mind when, when we're talking about. Uh, T cell receptors or B cell receptors. You're talking about B cell. So you're talking about the antibody and T cells. You're talking about T cell receptor. These T cell receptors aren't going to go float off and bind to things. But antibodies, when that um, when that B cell becomes activated, yeah. one of those signaling events may be to release those antibodies out into and, and have them floating out there. And, um, so it's good to kind of have in the back of your mind what's going on. Um, and understand the structure of, of antibodies versus T cell receptors. Um, so um, just go through these on your own. Also go through them in the book. Um, you have heavy and light chains. Uh, gonna, I'm really just jamming through this to see what's important and focus on what's important. Um, and then signaling. So specific. So now looking at B cells versus T cells, the specific, now again you can see that we have this cascade. Now the kinases that happen to be specific for B cells are different. So this upstream site lens are going to be specific for B cells, whereas for T cells they're going to be uh, different sets of kinases. But they're going to have ITAMs on the Ig molecules, just like T cells, the CD3 molecules are going to have ITAMs. They're going to this once we get down to this part of the pathway, or even up through here. This is going to be the same for B cells and T cells. Calcium is released. Calmodulin, calcineurin complex. Then we'll um, dephosphorylate the MFAT, and it'll go in, and then we have this PKC, which is going to again we specifically kind of cover that interact with PAG, and then go into um, downstream and cause NF kappa B to enter and become a trans active transcription factor. We have these um, G protein um, pathway goes through RAS and it activates AP1. So we have this MAP kinase, 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 and MAP kinase. So we have this whole MAP kinase path cascade that goes up there. Um, and then we have um, also signals coming through CD21 or CD19, which is associated with B cells and um, basically causing um, what cell survival. So if you don't get that signal, maybe you don't get that cell survival signal. So these are, these are specific for B cells. T cell receptors are also going to be similar. They're going to have constant regions and variable regions. And they are going to be dimers. And um, so these are heterodimers. So they're um, alphas and betas. There are gamma delta T cells, which are much more rare and more, are more um, associated with focused on lipid recognition. Um, we're not going to talk about those in much detail. Um, they're still actually not very well understood, um, but 
So alpha and beta, most T cell receptors are on alpha and on beta. Um, so T cell receptors are these heterodimers. Again, there are a small subset of T cells that have gamma delta um, as opposed to alpha beta. Um, C, uh, T cell co-receptors are CD4 and CD8. So helper T cells have CD4. Cytotoxic T cells have CD8. And they also bind to the con kind of these constant regions on the MHC molecules. Um, so uh, here, uh, C4s, their ligand is class two. So this is that. That would be something I really would expect people to start memorizing at this point. Was is um, who 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 does um, CD4 bind to? It binds to class two. Um, so CD4s have T cell receptors also that are specific for class two MHC that is uh, expressed on antigen presenting cells. CD8. Uh, these are the cytotoxic T cells or then specific for MHC class 1, which kind of makes sense because all of our cells have MHC class 1. If, I have, if I'm making a T cell that I want to kill a target cell that might be infected with like a virus, any viruses target a variety of different cells on the body. And say I have epithelial cells that are infected with this virus, I want to be able to, to target and kill that cell, um, sacrifice that cell. And so. Uh, but I don't want necessarily CD4 to be activated by it, so CD4 is a little bit, they're a little bit more picky about whether they become activated. They need to, they need to see antigen in the right context. And you need those CD4s stimulating CD8, so CD4s will make certain cytokines that CD8s have to see before they become effector cells. So all these cells are talking with each other and making sure that um, we really want to attack something. Um, these are also important, but not as important as those initial ones, although um, we're going to talk about later when we cover specifically T cell uh, activation versus B cell activation. We're going to talk about the CTLA-4 um, molecule that um, is upregulated and it um, interacts with these co-stimulatory molecules, so it will actually be late, expressed later on, and we'll talk about why. And so actually, antibodies that, that that bind to CTLA-4 might um, be used therapeutically, so we'll talk about that later, but you don't need to memorize necessarily. But it is good to know um, CD28 binds to these co-stimulatory molecules, CD80 and 86, and CTLA-4 binds, also binds to them. So this would actually cause a positive signal, and this would actually cause things to slow down. So CTLA-4 is expressed after cells have been activated. You don't need to mem remember that but we're going to talk about how um, that plays a role in uh, basically proliferation of activated cells. Um, and then, so the different, uh, what's different between T cells and B cells in this cascade, same cascade, different kinases again. We've got fin, lick, um, our, our players in T cell activation. We have the items again, same pathways um, that were also um, responsible for B cell activation. And again, um, co-stimulatory molecules can cause this survival signal. If you don't, especially in the cases of CD4s, if you don't get that survival signal, they will start proliferating, but they will then die. Um, so, um, signal transduction is complex. <laughs> I will try and make some cartoons or, or Simple diagrams of what I expect you to know, and I'll put that up. I'll try to get that out by tomorrow, um, and I will make an announcement when I do. Um, so both B and T cells use the same similar strategies, maybe different specific kinases, which actually uh, is, is good for us because, again, we can target and turn down or, or shut down kinases specifically um, in T cells and B cells. Say I'm having a humoral response to something. Say I'm having uh, uh, allergies or I'm having um, autoimmune disease and it's humoral, it's not cellular based. So maybe I, I don't want to I don't want to suppress my immune system but uh, I want to tell the B cells to chill out. So maybe I'll, I'll treat somebody with a small molecule that targets those um, kinases that are specific for B cells. So again knowing a little bit of the differences, we can be a little bit more uh, picky about what we're turning off. Differences lie at the level of the antigen receptor and the early membrane-linked events. 
And by understanding these um, receptors and early membrane differences, we can better understand how signaling and activation works in each lymphocyte cell type and therefore create different therapies or um, be able to induce um, immune responses. Maybe we want to turn off the immune response, or maybe we want to enhance it. Um, in the case of cancer, we want to enhance it. In the case of autoimmune disease, we want to turn it off. And therapies are going to basically, you're, you're going to see these pathways that you've learned here are targets for lots and lots of therapeutic um, drugs. Antibodies, lots of antibodies out there that target this pathway. Um, lots of small molecules that target kinases, lots of um, lots of antibodies that bind to the receptors in this pathway to either turn them on or block them from binding their ligand and, in effect, turning them off. So um, there have been a lot of these antibody therapies that have come out in the past 20 years or so. Um, uh, Receptin, breast cancer. 